video games, and here's a shocker, I love them. But as much as I love them, I tend to be in certain moods for certain games at certain times. We've all been there when it comes time to decide what to play. Very few of us are eeny, meeny, miny, mowers. We like to pick a game based on what mood we're in, or just stand there paralyzed by all the choices for a few minutes before giving up. But hey, wanna sink your teeth into a longer adventure? Perhaps an RPG will do the trick. Need something quick and dirty? Doesn't get any quicker or dirtier than Altered Beast. Looking for something you can shake your caboose to while you play? Samba de Amigo can get that party started for you, whether you got the maracas or not. And speaking of cabooses on the move in the name of fun, that would be me headed to the game room to play some Donkey Kong Country, one of the series that I'm pretty much always in the mood to play. That is, assuming I'm in the mood to play video Video games, which quick little diagram for you that shows the times I am. Now, as popular as the Donkey Kong Country series is, it's not loved by everybody. I mean, what game is? So if you're not a fan of the series, I'd like to invite you to sit back, relax, and just appreciate that a series brings other people a lot of enjoyment. You could even think of yourself like a parent watching kids playing. You wouldn't tell a kid what they're having fun with is stupid, would you? Well, let us have our fun too, adults or not. When it comes to the Donkey Kong Country series, one of the first things that sticks out to people is the vision especially back in the day, but even nowadays, at the very least, it garners a reaction of, hey, this looks kind of different. I remember when the Super Nintendo Mini came out, I was playing it in the same room as a friend of mine who doesn't really care about or appreciate older games. I know, boo to that friend, right? But when I fired up Donkey Kong Country, he says to me, how come this game looks so much better than all the other games? To which I am immediately thought, well, the other Super Nintendo games use more traditional sprite work that I think is beautiful in its own right, but the answer I gave him is that the game was made using pre-rendered 3D models that were then translated into 2D sprites, and that's the answer I gave him because that's what it is. At the time of release, it was especially groundbreaking, at a time when the video game industry was changing very fast and the ability to wow people was much more plausible. Although, wowing the gaming community as a whole typically came with new hardware, new consoles that could do new things. But here was a game in Donkey Kong Country that released four years after the console's initial launch in Japan. The amount of hardware that was pumped out between 1990 and 1994 was staggering, and yet here was a game made for 1990s Super Famicom hardware that many people found to be far more enjoyable and impressive than a large majority of all of that. Squeezing what they could out of quote-unquote outdated hardware, a very Nintendo-like move despite the game being developed developed by Rareware. But hold on a second, this game required a significant investment in the Silicon Graphics workstations that made the look of the game possible by rendering the 3D models. That's not outdated technology. Very true, but that was the people making the game's problem, not yours. All that you, the person playing the game, had to do was buy the game from Toys R Us or wherever, make sure your Super Nintendo still works stick it in there and enjoy. No new console or hardware to debate over whether it's worth the investment of buying. All right, but what about those people who made the game? They must be kind of important, right? Let's talk about them. Rareware, who would go on to be well known for their tremendous output on the Nintendo 64. But leading up to the release of Donkey Kong Country, they were most well known for making a bunch of games for the original Nintendo including the infamous Battletoads, which, coincidentally, one could argue tested the limits of what the NES could do, pushing the boundaries of how pissed off from difficulty a player could get. With Donkey Kong Country, Rare was being given a lot of trust. I mean, Donkey Kong was basically Shigeru Miyamoto's baby, seeing as he was the creator of the 1981 arcade game that was such a massive hit. Quick question for you, what do Japan 
Far and Nintendo have in common? Yep, you guessed it. They both felt threatened by Aladdin. In the case of Nintendo, it was Sega's Aladdin video game that made waves for how impressive its visuals and animations were. Having been worked on by actual Disney animators, it was a head turner, but Nintendo wanted people's heads to keep turning until they landed onto something for Nintendo. At the time, mascot platformers were all the rage, but with so many failed attempts to create new mascots, it made sense for Nintendo to lean on an already established character of their own, even if DK was to be given a new look and feel, not to mention be turned into the hero. My first impression of Donkey Kong Country couldn't have been under better circumstances. Well, almost. One of my older sisters was having a pizza party at a pizza parlor with her soccer team. And, as per usual, I was dragged along. I tell ya, there were some places I was more happy to get dragged to than others, and a pizza party was definitely one of them. Especially one that had, oh my goodness, is that Donkey Kong Country hooked up to a TV for everyone to play? Except I didn't know what Donkey Kong Country was at the time, so it was more like, oh my goodness, they have video games here? Hey, that was all it took to light my jollies as a kid. Kid. I went over to check it out and it just looked so fun. I didn't have a Super Nintendo as a kid, so this was novel for multiple reasons. A shiny new game on a console I didn't own. Only problem was that, as per usual, being in the little brother tier myself, naturally the bigger kids hogged it. So there I was, sad and straining to get a look at it. No turns for poor little me. But now I'm six foot four, own the game myself, and can have as many turns as I want. Who's getting the last laugh now? <laughs> me! <laughs> the answer is me! All I had to do was wait 20 years. But as for the game itself, the first thing that always stood out to me is the way that it uses color. The game really nails down the whole being in the country vibe. You can't just go throwing the word country into the name of your game and expect to get away with it unless you back it up. And this game knows it. The trees are vibrant, caves are appropriately moody with cool lighting effects, the water stages are atmospheric, there's a grouchy grandpa figure in a cabin, it doesn't get any more authentic than this. Okay, but what about the gameplay? Well, all the hallmarks of a platformer are here. You can run, you can jump, but you can also roll, throw barrels, and we're talking every kind of barrel your heart could desire. You can swing on ropes, blast yourself in and out of barrels, and ride in a minecart. Who wants to watch a two-hour video about why the minecart stages are one of the greatest things in existence? Count me in. And just give me six months to make that video and I'll have it ready. The game just feels like it's constantly giving you fun stuff to do. Oh, and how could I forget? The Animal Buddies, clearly inspired by Mario riding Yoshi, arguably one of the most satisfying parts of Super Mario World. Rare thought, hey, why not have a whole bunch of different Animal Buddies that you can tear around on? It's essentially a clever way of giving the player a power-up. It even makes the water stage is a romp to play through. A real power trip slicing and dicing your way through all the baddies on a swordfish. In fact, you know what? I would say that romp is actually a pretty good way to describe how it feels to move through the game. There's an energetic yet carefree nature to the game. The controls feel incredibly smooth, movement is fast, and there's a certain rhythm to the gameplay. I don't think this is any coincidence either, as taking out each enemy makes a satisfying sound and mark on the screen that almost feels like a musical note in the symphony that is your run through the stage. Not quite to the extent of something like Res, where that effect is far more blatant, but it's enough to give the game a good feel. Tying the experience of the game all together quite nicely would be the soundtrack, which is 
excellent. Heck, the musical track for the water stages goes so deep it brings out emotions you didn't even know you had. Oh, I love my mom even more than I thought I did. I should call her and tell her why. Then, next thing you know, you're out of the water and raging down a minecart track. This game has always given me fun vacation vibes. Something about the country setting. Sure, there's a fruit thieving crocodile on the loose, but if you ran into a croc out on a vacation, what would you choose between the crocodile either stealing your fruit or, oh, I don't know, biting off your leg? Obvious answer there, give up the leg. You can still eat nanners without it. All right, but now it's time to talk about the collectibles in this game. This game gives you a whole bunch of different ways to collect lives. You can find red, green and blue balloons that will give you one, two, or three lives respectively, but then there's also the famous Kong letters you find scattered about. Find all four letters in a stage and you earn yourself an extra life. But perhaps even more valuable, it teaches you how to spell words like Kong and they try to say video games aren't good for you. There's also the golden tokens that are shaped like the various animal buddies. Collect three of any one of them and you'll unlock a bonus area where you can earn a ton of additional lives. And if all of this still isn't enough opportunity to earn extra lives, there's one more way you can do it that's perhaps the easiest method of all. Okay, so remember how there's red, green, and blue balloons that you can collect for extra your lives? That's great, but what about yellow? Well, even better than that, you can collect yellow bananas. And there's a lot of them. Nanners here, nanners there, nanners in your underwear. Hey, sometimes I like to hide them in places where nobody will look. Never underestimate a banana thief. Words to live by. I pretty much never leave the house. For every 100 bananas you collect, you'll earn yourself an extra life. And trust Trust me, you can really start to rack up the lives, especially when you factor in all the other ways you can also earn additional lives. And check this out, the official player's guide basically tells you that you suck at the game if you're unable to accumulate enough extra lives. It reads, the average player should be able to keep playing for a long time and not have to worry about running out of lives. That means they're saying if you run out of lives, that makes you a below average player, which is just a more sugary way of them saying you suck. But here's the thing, Donkey Kong Country has a reputation for being a difficult game. So as much as the game gives you lots of opportunities to earn extra lives, it also gives you lots of opportunities to die. I would still categorize it as fair difficulty though, as within the individual stages themselves, they do a great job of introducing mechanics and hazards you'll need to master early in the stage, then ramping up those same challenges as the stage moves along. Also, you can continue as many times as you want, but Here's where Donkey Kong Country gets kind of weird. You can only save once you've reached Candy's save points, which sometimes you have to beat a whole bunch of stages in a row before you can do this. But after you reach it, you can save as many times as you want. So the hardest parts of the game end up being the stretches where you have to beat multiple stages in a row before you can save. Plus, if it's your first time playing the game, you don't even know how many more stages it's going to take to get to the next save point. So there you are, doing everything you can to beat a stage. You finally beat it, and come on, give me a save point. Ah, oh, it's another stage I gotta beat. To get around this a little bit, if you happen to reach the Funky's flight stop first, you could always just fly back to a different area and save there, then fly right back. I don't know, the whole setup just feels kinda weird to me. Although, as a longtime player, I do appreciate the extra challenge, even if it does come from something strange. Another thing that some players find to be strange about the first DKC in particular is 
is the secret areas, or rather how you find them. The game does give subtle hints here and there, but I found that the best way to find them was often just holding a barrel in front with Diddy Kong and then brushing up against walls to see if they would break. Yep, secrets hidden by walls. Kind of reminds me of Castlevania or even Dark Souls. That's another thing I've learned from video games. I don't trust walls. I just never look at them the same way anymore. Add it to the list of things video games have taught us. As for the hints that the game will sometimes give you, they can vary, but here's some advice. Follow the bananas. Sometimes it's just a single banana that clues you in too. And again, words to live by. Bananas lead to great things. I found some really cool stuff this way. All right, now when talking about the sequel, Donkey Kong Country 2 and 3, most of what I've said so far applies to them as well, but I do want to highlight some of the key differences that stand out to me. Starting with Donkey Kong Country 2, Diddy's Kong Quest. Don't get your tongue tied up in a knot on that one. And seeing as we were just talking about reaching the bonus areas, let's start with that. This game makes the secret areas easier to find with much less subtle hints, but still subtle enough to make you feel like you found something cool. Although it does make me understand why in the first game they wanted to make the secrets, well, more secret. With the idea being to make it more exciting when you, hey, I found a secret. That being said, I can understand some players feeling like it was overly cryptic, and even I'll admit that multiple times it amounted to jumping into death pits just to see if there was a secret barrel down there. But regardless of how secret or kinda secret some of the secrets might be, some might just argue forget the secrets altogether as they just hamper the speed and flow of the gameplay. It's kind of like the song games in that way, where there's different ways to play the game, each with their own incentives. But speaking of speed and flow of the game, let's talk about the characters you play as, since they play a large role in this. In the second game, they got rid of Donkey Kong as a playable character. I mean, who needs to play as the character a game is named after anyway? Which you might think is kind of stupid until you play as Dixie Kong and start hella Coptering around with her hair. Diddy Kong is a faster character than Donkey Kong, and most players will tell you he's easily the better character of the two. My guess is that because Rare was trying to sell us on Diddy Kong, who was a brand new character at the time, they were inclined to make sure he felt good to use. The official player's guide calls Diddy a wannabe. Jeez, this thing talks a lot of crap. Regardless, Diddy Kong became the lead for the second game because he feels so good to use. That helicopter hair though, that can really save your butt from a lot of bad situations, I tell ya. In addition to some of the animal buddies from the last game, there's new additions to this game as well, of which my personal favorite by far is Ratley the Rattlesnake. I mean, just look at that face! And bouncing around the stages like a pogo stick, now this is fun. Definitely some of the stages that I look forward to the most. Now, when it comes to saving your progress in this game, you can and luckily save as much as you want. That is, assuming you have the coins required to do so. Although these specific coins are pretty easy to come by, especially compared to the newly introduced DK coins, so it shouldn't be much of an issue. The other fortunate thing is that you can save fairly early on in each area and on average earlier than the save points in the first game. All right, now what about the theme of the game? Back to the beautiful countryside, right? Wrong. The second game has a much darker theme and doesn't really give off the stereotypical being out in the country vibe as the series namesake would imply. But the whole piratey theme of the game is done so so darn well that I'd say who cares, as would many others. Plus, in a trilogy of games, variety is appreciated. If you do really like the countryside theme of the first
first game though, the third game has you covered. I love the atmosphere of this game. Remember how I said the first game gives me vacation vibes? Well, so does this game in a big way. If I had owned this game back in the day, I would have liked to go on a vacation where I bring my Super Nintendo to a cabin by a lake and then play this game during the downtime in between the outdoors stuff. Sounds like the dream. Did anybody ever do that? If so, please tell me about it so I can live vicariously through your story. Okay, but now we unfortunately have to talk about some of the hate that this game gets. A burden many third entries in a series carry. Although this may be becoming an outdated trend, as I feel like lately I see more and more people saying that the hate is unwarranted, then I see the actual people supposedly doing this hating. Where did they all go? When it comes to what the hate was for, maybe it's because in 1996 people had moved on to the next generation, but it might just be as simple as people not liking Kitty Kong, who is a big baby, literally. I think he far from ruins the game, but I can still see why he's not people's favorite. His drawbacks are as follows. Slower at accelerating from a stop, slower at climbing, can't jump as far or as high, and a larger hitbox while swimming. Great, who even cares what the upsides are with those kinds of negatives? And as a nice little cherry on top, he does this annoying crying thing when you lose a life. This is coming hot off the heels of Yoshi's Island too, with baby Mario winding up a storm. What was going on back then? Maybe it was part of Nintendo's strategy in the mid 90s? In any case, people tend to prefer the smaller, more nimble characters for these games, as opposed to the characters deemed to be big lumbering doofuses by comparison. Hey, what do people have against big lumbering doofuses? Well, they're big, they're lumbering, and they're doofuses, I suppose, would be the answer. At least the game has Dixie Kong and that helicopter hair, though, as well as some great stages. Some would tell you that this game, and to some extent the second game, tried out too many gimmicks, but are these the same people that say the games are too simple? I mean, should they try to mix things up or not? Come on, gimmicks aren't an inherently bad thing, that's only if they aren't done well, and I'd argue many of them are done well, like the minecart stages. Heck, Mario's ability to throw fireballs is technically a gimmick, where are the people saying all gimmicks suck on that one? Now, if you want to make the argument that this game's particular gimmicks aren't done well, then sure, that's fair, but myself as well as many others do like them, saying the game has a ton of variety and creativity in it. Plus, you still spend most of the time running and jumping, so it's not like it loses its platformer roots. Okay, what else does this game have? Oh, banana birds! You know, I have every reason to be a big fan of this, and yet I can safely say I do not like this. What's going on with the eyes? Something is just not right here. Although, the in-game version is certainly a lot better. Yeah, I can say I'm a fan of them there. Just as I can say I'm a huge fan of this entire trilogy as a whole. My goodness. Video games that tickle all the right notes in my brain and in my soul. With the result being timeless experiences that can always bring me to a happy place. You know, when it comes to platformers, which might just be my favorite genre, I think one of the biggest things it comes down to for me is what I describe as joyful movement. Something all my favorite games do well. Heck, Rocket Knight has a jetpack that's a blast, literally and figuratively. In the Donkey Kong Country games, it's the flow of movement. The bouncy, smooth, rhythmic flow that makes you feel like you're building up momentum as you progress through the stages. I've also found that when getting people into retro gaming initially, these games seem to be fairly effective at doing so, making them them a good representative for retro gaming. All right, but how would I personally rank the three games, you might be wondering? Well, I would guess very few people rank them the same as I do. My ranking goes DKC1, DKC3, 
DKC2. Although honestly, they're all 10 out of 10 games for me, so the ranking is almost irrelevant. If I were to look at it more objectively, I'd say the second game is probably the best, and most people tend to agree with that. But how would you personally rank the games? And yes, even the haters can get in on this question. We don't have high expectations for your answers, but feel free regardless. Also, if you're wondering about the other games in the series, I enjoy them as well, but I wanted to focus on the original trilogy for this video. So with that, leave your rankings along with anything else you might like to say, and I will see ya in the next video. Hi, yeah. Out looking for Snickers again. I'm starting to get really worried. It's been like a month now that I've been looking for them. Yeah, well, I mean, you know what they say about cats. They can be vengeful, spiteful, and what the? No, 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 no! Stole my banana! This is why I never leave the house except to look for that cat. I know this was Snickers. He's the only one who knew about these. Well, I'll find you this time. I don't care if I have to look all night. I'll find you. I'll find you. Snickers! He's the Red Cooper, yeah. And he's talking, talking about video games. He's